I would say like these past two days, I have learned so much from each and every one of you. Uh, so I hope I can share some learnings of what I went through working in the global space with you. Um, and I'll throw in some mental health tidbits, as you will see. <laughs> All right, so this is my presentation, International Project Strategies for Women in the Global Workspace. Oh gosh. I'll be Ah, yay! Okay, so that's me. We, are <laughs> we already went through that. <laughs> all right, so today we're going to go uh, cover all the elements from my doctoral study, uh, from the background and problem statement, my purpose, completing the research. Uh, I will discuss my framework that I use and findings, those how those strategies relate to professional practice and the implications for social change. And then the study model, <clears throat> study model that I also created with my community chair and if we have time probably will uh we'll have some q a okay so my doctoral journey started in 2017 when i relocated to dubai united arab emirates to start a position as a preservation project specialist in this role i was the corporate liaison for the real estate development team and the facilities contractors for uh the stores there as well as the commercial team for the mall developers and from the complexity of my projects and the numerous amount of challenges and obstacles I had to grapple with, I felt there was a need for this research in the international project space. I was working in a male dominated field and environment and it was extremely challenging for me as well, but resilience is within every woman in every industry. Uh, cost schedule and scope also known as the triple constraints are the most critical elements of international development projects and the cause of project failure. The participants and the location of my research is in the Middle East where conventional project management methodologies, processes and tools are not feasible. We have to dig deeper as women, as project managers with thinking processes and elevated strategies in order to be successful. So here's my official problem statement, which uh, I will not read in its entirety, but the general problem is that project managers and international development projects are, are negatively affected by cost, schedule, and scope, which results in a loss of profitability for the business. The specific business problem is during an international development project, some project managers lack strategies to meet the project's cost, schedule, and scope. Uh, a clear point that I want to make here is that this is as of 2017, 64% of international projects fail. But I just researched um, while like changing up this presentation that as of 2024, that number increased to 70%. We're on a, we're not on a downward trend. <laughs> Our project failures are going up. And just to clarify, not saying that each international development project or just project in general in the global space is failing in totality. It's that either they went over budget, they're not on time or the scope change. That is considered a failure. If all three of those things are not in alignment, then it's okay. So 70%, that's ridiculous. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, we will. <laughs> so the purpose of this study, of the research study, reiterates the problem statement and states that my goal with this research is to reduce the negative effects of cost, schedule, and scope on international development projects. Now, because this research is based on development specifically, the findings and strategies that I will share can easily be transferable in any industry um, in, in any global project. So lastly, the research identifies the social implications of the work, which are one, the opportunity to increase business profitability. Of course, we all wanna make more money. Increase wages for project managers, yes, advance equal pay, yes, and contributing to a healthier, safer work environment for workers, definitely, their families and the communities. Meaning my work here positive, positively impacts the project management community as a whole, better business, better employees, better home life, better community. So the research question, 
And the million dollar question is, what strategies do project managers use to meet the cost, schedule, and scope of international development projects? Now, I've like five years it took to write this study and to receive my doctorate. And it was the brutal <laughs> five years of my life. I, I quit every semester. Um, <laughs> I was like, I, I can't do this, especially with all the corrections and edits. If you know, you know. Um, but the theory, which took me like a year to figure out that I felt was most appropriate for my research was the theory of constraints, because we're talking about constraints. It was developed by Dr. Eli Goldrath, and he's the author of a book titled The Goal, A Process of Ongoing Improvement, which if you're not familiar, please look it up, among several others. And the TOC, for short, simply means suggest that organizations can achieve their goals by identifying and leveraging a system's constraints, turning it into a workable procedure that program and pro project managers understand so that they can see the reality of the issues and how to address them. There are five steps to the theory of constraints. And step one is identify the constraint, exploit the constraint, subordinate and synchronize to the constraint, elevate performance of the constraint and then repeat the process over again. So the plot thickens, could it be that the TOC may provide the insights needed to determine why project managers meet or fail to complete this project's goals? So let's dig in. So my findings, I conducted semi-structured interviews uh, with Zoom very late nights and early mornings. I was already back in the USA when I started my interview process and research uh, participant process. So it was like 9 a.m. for them, 11 p.m. for me, it was brutal. Um, but doing Zoom calls late night, um, I interviewed uh, female, one female and four males that were in the development space. And then also conducted outside interviews with three other women who are boss project managers, had their own businesses. Three themes emerged. Uh, from our conversations, which are scope management, stakeholder management, and project management planning, which just is, those are the, the main elements of each project, and there's still issues with it, even though we're doing it every day. So since global projects are above and beyond basic project management principles, we have to elevate scope management to another level. So your international project is complex, difficult, it's filled with ambiguity, and you need to surpass that and transform and mold your normal project management knowledge. So the first strategy seems, I think it, yeah, the first strategy seems simple enough, which is to collect and define requirements and then control the scope <coughs> in detail. Simple, right? No, all five participants, everybody I know that does anything project-based, everyone says <laughs> that you can collect all the requirements in detail from the very beginning of the project, but you have to make sure that you're collecting it from the beginning, uh, not just them telling you, I want this to be done. And you're like, okay, cool. And you just go, no, 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 no. You got to clear that off from the get-go get <laughs> because it always ends up something more. You have to brainstorm and wicked problem solve our way and get down to the nitty gritty details of the scope because the critical difference in collecting requirements from standard project management process compared to the experiences, to their experiences is to clearly communicate the exact needs from the stakeholders and the impact of the changes to scope cost and schedule. So, cause you have to just be, you have to clearly articulate what the implications are if you change the scope. I think that's where a lot of people kind of get lost because especially when we are in a pleasing moment, uh, you don't want to say no. Yeah, we can do it. Oh, okay, well, can we do this? Can we change this? Can we alter the scope? Can we just add a whole bunch on there that we didn't even mention before because now we're feeling different about the project. Can we do it? Sure. No, don't do that. <laughs> you have to have to clearly articulate, articulate what that application is going to be. And that was a significant challenge, but also an opportunity and well-received 
from the international space is that you have to be supremely transparent. Most cultures want you to be clear with timelines, worst case scenario with a backup number. I found that the more I explained the implications, the better received that the timeline was. Um, and you have to control the scope, which we all know sometimes is inevitable, especially when a C-suite leader comes around and says, we wanna change the entire project right now. <laughs> but that does not mean that you cannot say, okay, great, we can make this change, but here are the implications to the cost, schedule, and scope. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to give me an extra $3 million since you wanna add another building to this building? <laughs> Be clear. <laughs> They're gonna be like, oh no, okay then. This that idea. Let's throw that out the window. This information can also be found in your change management plan. <laughs> and if you do not have one beforehand, congratulations, you have one now. <laughs> sure. Oh, girl, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I'm in tech now <laughs> and we're hybrid. <laughs> so we have regular and we have agile. Um, I can't say where I work, but I will say this it's nuts. <laughs> it's nuts. We just go with the flow um, <laughs> and we try to make the best out of it. Um, but I always, I find that when I tap into the basics of like the knowledge that we get. So when you become PNP certified, you know, that horrible test that you have to take when you get agile certified. And as the experience goes on, a lot of people forget the basics that you have to study in order to get certified. If you go back to that, you'll come back on track. Because a company would just transform your whole way of thinking. And you're just like, no, 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 wait. Y'all lost this piece. So that's how we kind of stay focused. <laughs> um, so stake governance, this participants uh, discuss two strategies for stakeholder management. And we're going to elevate this as well into stakeholder governance. Um, the two strategies are identify the key stakeholders, build a relationship, and prepare for cultural differences. That was just one, but that could totally be separate. And the second was clear communications, again, and project status transparency. So with the first strategy, all participants recommended the strategy of identifying key stakeholders, but building trustworthy relationships with those stakeholders in order to reduce those constraint issues. So based on my own observations and those of the other participants, it's common for relationships with stakeholders like contractors, material handlers, to persist throughout the course of global projects. Um, they can change, they can change their mind, they can, you know, it's, it's just insane when it comes down to global landscape. But similar to like a house flipper, you might repeatedly use the same contractor, build that relationship, and that can lead to continued collaboration. However, when you're on an international level, prioritizing human connections and relationships becomes even more important. Um, sometimes it just can be very transactional and robotic, but in an international space, they don't get down like that. They actually want to know you. <laughs> I'm like, what? Oh, oh, you're asking me a question about me personally? Okay. But it's cool though. It's cool because then they can do what I want, um, <laughs> build, building, maintaining that relationship. So the project managers also stated that they need to be cognizant of the different cultures of their stakeholders and create clear communications plans, being transparent about status and the process throughout the entire project. And that was something that um, took me a very, I would say a few months um, to do in Dubai, because when I came over there, I was uh, in charge of a team of, um, I was, what was it like five, five to eight contractors, all men um, from Pakistan and Iraq, um, 
and a few from the local Emiratis. And they were just not used to a black woman being in charge. <laughs> a woman, period. So I'm going in there and I'm like, hey, this was okay. So let's do our walkthrough of the facility. Okay, this floor, when was the last time it was fixed? Ignored. Straight up. Like, who's this? Who are you? I'm not. I'm the one you need to report to, bro. What are you talking about? And of course, I'm a I'm thousand percent American. So they're like, what? First of all, we don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> Your English is shit. So I'm just like, oh. <laughs> like, how can I? What is going on here? Big hoops and everything. Like, I'm still me. I'm still authentic. What? So I'm walking in there like, let me explain it to you. This floor is tall up. <laughs> it needs to be fixed. When was the last time you did it? It took a while for us to get used to each other. <laughs> They had to get used to me. I had to get used to them and used to them ignoring me um, <laughs> until they realized that, oh, she knows her. She knows her stuff. Um, got into a huge argument about the door being fixed. And I've seen that problem in three stores in the States. And he's like, no, we have to replace the whole door. No, you don't. It's the handle and the latch. It's the handle and the latch. Da -da 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 -da. Sir? It's the handle and the latch. I guarantee you, if you replace that, the door is fine. You don't need to replace the door. That's going to cost $25,000. Replace the handle and the latch, 300 bucks. Took three months to get there instead of overnight like it is in the States. I didn't know that. Learned that too. And when it came in, the door was fixed. So I'm like, okay. Oh, she didn't know. Yeah, that's why you report to me. Like, who are you talking to? Anyway, I digress. So yeah, <laughs> clear communications, you have to do it. Um, in many international business contexts, there may be a huge language barrier yes. that can hinder effective communication. Um, it is important to have a good interpreter or translator. A lot of, it was normal, it, every, all businesses conducted in English, thank God. Um, my Arabic is horrible. I know like three words and that's it. Um, but I learned and you know we became like really cool and they, if they didn't learn, if they didn't know English, um, they always had, we always had like the main leader of the contractors. He knew English very well. He was able to interpret for me. Yes, Dali. Mm -hmm. For you, or well, what actually barrier? Yeah. Yeah. We were speaking, we might just use yeah. the black women. Yeah. That's it. Black young women. That too. <laughs> it was all of it. It was all of it. Yeah, yeah, they're like, this American. Yeah, well, I'm like, oh, at least you call me American. I love it. Thank you. That's a compliment. <laughs> Don't call me this, this crazy black woman. Don't say that, even though that was said to me. Um, and I was called fat every single day. Yeah, they're like, why are you so fat? Why are Americans so fat? Damn, why are you starting off this conversation about that? That's not the point here. I'm here to talk about the wall falling apart. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah, yeah, it was real in Dubai. Yeah, my mental health was like, Carol. Which is why I go to therapy, so I don't put the world down in flames. Um, <laughs> it was real. If it wasn't for meditation, I would have. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. The president would not have came to get me. Um, <laughs> so yes, yeah. This is the whole forward. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was rough. It was rough. Um, from the planning side, so for project management planning, two themes emerge: take as much time as needed to plan correctly so important and create a transition plan with a focus on process improvement. Uh, many project managers, I am a victim of that, uh, rush planning, which cannot happen on international projects. You have to take the time to plan. I am used to things being done in 24 to 48 hours, straight up. Like that's how we got down in my stores in the States. So when I came out there, I didn't realize that I had to wait 30 days for the part to come in because it came from the same place in America. Um, and then scheduling was horrendous. Um, and then during Ramadan, we had to be respectful of the hours. The malls were open to like 2, 3 a.m. And I'm like, I, I'm supposed to work till then? Good grief. Oh my gosh. Like, I'm used to malls closing at 9, 10 tops. It was rough. So, and then those shipments were delayed. Um, just you have to know the constant changes in the constant environment that you're in. And this affects your planning. Um, so like the complexity of international projects, the international development projects are involve multiple stakeholders from different cultures, different languages, different frameworks, 
different regulations and rules um, legally. Everything had to be cleared with like four different levels of the state or of the country. I didn't know that either. It's not as simple as just fix the floor, just fix the foundation, just fix the electrical, just fix the water, the plumbing. No, it has to go to the mall management, it has to go to the state if we're digging into the any type of construction, it's so deep. So I had to learn all, all of that. And, I, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, let's get this done tomorrow. They're like, what? <laughs> Relax. <laughs> I was just like, okay, we can't just get it done tomorrow. All right, fine, whatever. Um, so yeah, it was it was a lot. Um, limited resources. Where am I at? Is this in here? Oh yeah, okay. It kind of runs together. All right. So limited resources. Um, development projects have limited resources, financial materials. Everything is sourced. Um, we didn't. Well, the company that I work for had its own specific manufacturers. It did not buy locally, which was another issue, um, which caused delayed timing. So we had to do that. Um, and then effective risk mitigation planning had to be done. We had to mitigate the project risk by identifying the risk of the, uh, the environment we were in weather-wise, cost overruns, um, just a whole bunch of negative outcomes. All those projects probably failed in one constraint or another. Um, and then proper planning with the stakeholders. Um, some did not have this, you didn't have their support or buy-in when you wanted to change or when something went wrong. Uh, accountability and transparency. Good planning establishes those clear goals, those timelines, and those metrics for success. Um, and it keeps everyone accountable and transparent to those project funders and those stakeholders. So take the time to plan. It's is how you will be successful or more successful and reduce as many negative outcomes as possible. Um, so then with transitioning, smooth transition to future projects, you have to ensure that a smooth handoff for the project deliverables, the knowledge, responsibilities, you have to do that for the next person that you're, is going to be your successor, which I that is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, because I came in not knowing a lot, even though I replaced someone else, um, that person did not um, operate the same level of leadership that I did. Um, so that's why the team was used to doing everything on their own without having to go to that person. But I don't operate that way. And that was not the, the role and responsibility of that position. So I came in ready and they were not ready for that. <laughs> which is okay um that's how i get down uh, but you got to do the lessons learned transition planning provides an opportunity to identify and document lessons learned this is so important um you have to learn from the success you have to learn from the failures uh those scheduling timelines those delivery delays the legal ramifications of changes none of that was documented so how am I supposed to prepare my next person to do, you know, if they don't know either, they're going to be stuck in the same position I was, can't do that. Um, continuous improvement, process improvement, details captured in lessons learned, documentation can help identify areas of improvement too. And this is especially important for international projects to improve those practices. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a project manager by heart and just a lot of people weren't familiar with like how the project management processes and knowledge areas work, how I work, how come my documents look like this as compared to what they looked like before. Um, and I'm just like, this is all project management stuff. This is what I do. This is what I'm here for. And they're like, oh, I did not know this. Oh my God. So yeah, educate. You have to educate, um, which is fine. Um, proper closure of your project create that's part of your transition plan as well and ensures that the project is properly closed out the final delivery of the deliverables documentation other artifacts all need to be part of your closing plan and this can help ensure that the project meets its objectives and satisfies the requirements of the stakeholders because you're sending out reports and things like that so you have to have everything documented what went wrong for the leaders that care um some leaders just like okay is it done all right great thanks you don't want to report, you don't want to know. Okay, you don't want to know like what's going on. Huh? So I 
I changed them. I changed their minds too. Here's your report about everything. Um, I got to move on because I only got like a couple minutes. Okay, so just yeah, out here. So the implications for social change, where is it? Innovative and creative project management strategies can help reduce adverse effects on the triple constraints of the cost schedule and scope on international development projects leading to an increased business profitability and contri contributing to a healthier and safer work environment. Um, by working collaborat collaboratively with stakeholders and prioritizing the needs of all involved, project managers can deliver successful outcomes that not only will meet the project goals, but also positively impact communities and society as a whole. And we will definitely see an increase in pay we deserve gender equality and to reduce the pay gap down to zero. And we already work three times as harder <laughs> as our counterparts. So we deserve to have the pay to go with it. That is true social change. Um, this is the study model that I created with my professor, my co-chair, Dr. Goffett. Um, and it just shows the inverse and regular on-demand uh, relationship of product project strategies based on different uh, elements we have included here. So problem solving, this is all based in the Middle East. So it's different um, demands, demands, needs, and wants. But this study model can be converted with different demands, needs, and wants based on a different area. Uh, but we have those strategies, like strategies to be positive. This is where positive results are. And if it's negative, this is that piece that goes along with it. And it's just a continuous cycle. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes, no. Yeah. So in the, in the study model, like, hmm. Yes, I think it just, um, it was brought up with a few other participants and it's based off, I guess, just the experience being there. I was only there for about two and a half years. And in that, it, yeah, that, when that contract was up, I was like, bye. <laughs> they were like, you want to stay? No, bye, I'm going home. Uh, where I can say what I want, do what I want. Um, <laughs> sort of. Um, but um it's, it's based on the experience. Like in those two years, I learned everything about it. <laughs> and I think it's just something that goes with time. Uh, emotional intelligence about international projects is just something that just came through on time. And then I took another international project when I went back to the States in a totally different area. So, but I made those connections being there. So that experience and that knowledge came with me. I travel with, like, with every position that I hold now. I have that global knowledge. It just keeps growing. I think that's all experience based. Um, everyone there had their experience working with another person from a different culture. So that kind of increased the intelligence for everybody. I learned a lot and I, I think they learned a lot about me. Because you're bringing up the subject of emotional intelligence versus yeah. cultural intelligence. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's different. It's different because it's. It's different when you're in person with someone that's really from somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, like I, you know, it's like America. So <laughs> we black, white, and Spanish. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's different. It's different. It's like a function based. So it can apply a whole everywhere. It's got American mixture of culture. Yeah. It's a you know, what I am for a hair, okay, facing that I can do. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. People and stuff like that. And you know, uh, in our place, how was that position in the Union? Uh, so I think actually they supply like now all over the world. So yeah. just 